Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today I'm going to cover In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, a true account of a multiple murder and its consequences. This is book three for my 2022 reading list. Well, this is a story of two men, Dick and Perry, who kill four members of the Cutter family at their home in Holcomb, Kansas, on the evening of November 15th, 1959. It's what's called a nonfiction novel. So the story happened, these murders happened in real life, but the book is written in such a way that it, it reads like a work of fiction. It reads as a novel. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, but it's, it's called a nonfiction novel. And what Truman Capote does is he weaves a story together in a brilliant way to bring these killers together with those who are killed and then to show, as the subtitle states, the consequences. The title of this book is very interesting, In Cold Blood. When, when I think of that, I think of uh, the, the terms often used in the case of a murder, and it, it's almost like a way to separate us from murderers. So we're, we're warm-blooded, uh, but if something is done in cold blood, it's, it's done without feeling, it's done, it's just done, but the, the idea is that someone cold-blooded is not like us, and, and in fact, we're not even relatable. Uh, we're warm-blooded, so someone kills in cold blood. They're they're not like us. It it puts a distance and a layer between us. But in this book, while the murders are done in cold blood and it's chilling and it's hard to read about, the murderers are not cold-blooded in the sense that you start to actually feel sympathy for them, especially for for Perry. And it, it makes the book rather uncomfortable because yes, it's in cold blood, but they're, they're not, you don't, you, you start to not view them as cold-blooded killers. And, and it just, it, it makes for this very uncomfortable book. It, it reminded me a lot of Crime and Punishment. And in that book, the protagonist, Raskolnikov, he's certain that he can commit a crime and get away with it. And by getting away with it, he means from the authorities, like the authorities will never catch him. But he's also, he's kind of testing something to see if he can get away with it from himself. Like if if he can look at himself in the mirror after killing a lady that he believes is not worth society having around. So he, he thinks he's actually kind of doing society a favor. And if he kills her, can he get away with it? Can he elude his own conscience? He can elude the authorities, but can he elude his own conscience? And so there's some similarities in this book. The, the killers in this one, Dick and Perry, they are also seeing if they can get away with murder. And and Dick fancies himself a, a very smart man. And so he he's pretty certain that he can commit the perfect crime. And he nearly does in the sense of being able to to elude the law and uh, the authorities, the, the the law enforcement. But there's that other aspect of it as well. Can he get away with it? from his own conscience and can him and Perry together get away with it from their own conscience. So yes, there are the legal consequences, but murder sets forth something inside and the inner consequences are are such that the law cannot touch that. And, and I, I find these types of books very interesting just to, you, you get in the mind of, of these of these killers. And with, with crime and punishment, yes, that's a work of fiction. Uh, this one is a work of nonfiction, but just that looking in deep to the killer's mind and and kind of seeing what's going on there and seeing what's going on, especially after the fact, I, I, I really find those books to be interesting. So for reading stats, this one was 396 pages. It took me 10 hours and one minute to read it. That was over four days. So I I read uh, 99 pages per day, which is on the very high end for me. And what that means is that uh, I couldn't put it down. I I wanted to put it down. I I was getting scared at points and I would read it before sleep. And then I would be worried that I would have nightmares. But uh, it was one of those that I just could not 
put down. It was suggested by Casey Kep in her book, Furious Hours, which I read in 2020. And that is a book about a serial killer in Alexander City, Alabama. And uh, the the, the, ser- the there was a trial that was somewhat associated with the ser- serial killer and Harper Lee attended the the trial and was gathering information to potentially write a book like this in cold blood and what i learned in that book furious hours is that harper lee was very good friends with truman capote and in fact she attended the trials for the dick and perry the the two killers in this book and took a ton of notes gave 150 pages of those notes to capote Capote and Harper Lee were childhood friends, and and so Harper Lee was was almost going to perhaps write a book like In Cold Blood uh, of her own for these murders that took place in in Alabama, but she never did that, and and so that book kind of explores what happened, uh, why, but you also learn a lot about her friendship with with Truman Capote, and just in reading that book, it got me interested in wanting to read In Cold Blood. Uh, and, and I got the book from Landmark Booksellers in Franklin, Tennessee. And since that time that when I got the book, I've, I've started working there as the business manager. So you can also get the book from, from Landmark if you'd like. I'll link to it in the show notes. And if you uh, buy it from Landmark, just use the coupon code Books of Titans, and you'll get 10% off of the book. But uh, yeah, you can help support this podcast by by doing that, by purchasing the book from Landmark. So look for that in the show notes. For the rest of this episode, uh, I'm gonna. Uh, there's two more segments. The next segment, is, I'm going to cover four things that stuck out to me. And then in segment three, the final segment, I'm going to cover the one thing, my one key takeaway from In Cold Blood. Well, here are four things that stuck out to me in, in this book. The first is just the, the type of book it is. Uh, we, there are a lot of podcasts out there right now that are called True Crime. There are a number of books that are of, of that genre. And this is kind of the, as, as far as I understand, this is kind of the godfather of, of those true crime books. Uh, and it's called a few different things. So one is true crime. Another is, as I stated at the beginning, nonfiction novel, which is the telling of a true story by using the techniques of fiction. And it, it, actually in the introduction, uh, there's a, a, another description. So Capote's interest in the murder of a family in Kansas led to the prolonged investigation that provided the basis for In Cold Blood, his most successful and acclaimed book. By treating a real event with fictional techniques, Capote intended to create a new synthesis, something both immaculately factual and a work of art. So that, that's uh, a little more information on, on what this was like. There's, there's a third thing it's called, and that is new journalism. And when I think of new journalism, I think of Tom Wolfe, the the author. And uh, so Truman Capote w- may have been kind of at the forefront of of that. And in one aspect of new journalism is is the telling of stories as they unfold. And that's one thing you see throughout this book. Like like you you know what's ha- you know what's going to happen. Like you know that a family of four is going to get murdered, but you you're in suspense the whole time. Like how is it going to happen? Uh these two things don't look like they're going to match like the killers and the, and those who are killed. How is that going to happen? And and so Capote just does a brilliant job of of con- constructing the book in such a way that that it's almost a surprise, even though you know exactly what's going to happen. So very interesting style. And and just to kind of take a step back from this, this is something I'm very interested in is just how do, how do you present a, a story? Uh, you, you heard me say at the beginning of this episode, the purpose of this project, my, my overarching goal is to seek truth in the world's best books. So what, what does that mean for a book like this? And, and part of it, part of Part of my interest in this book is just to see how the story is told. There are a number of ways you could tell this story. Uh, you you could you could tell it as a newspaper article would tell it, and you would have kind of the the bare minimum of, of the story of what happened. There there was a murder, a family of four, and uh, when it happened, they didn't know who did it. And so, you know, you can you that would maybe take you five minutes to read, but you can get a good idea of of what happened, or you can read a story like this where you're you're finding out what happens as 
the peop- the detectives are finding out what happens, as the neighbors are finding what out what happens, as the boyfriend of the daughter who was killed find out finds out what happens. So there, there's that way of, of of telling a story like this, and uh, makes me think back to one of the first books I read for this project. And it was the things they carried by Tim O'Brien, and he just talks about different different types of truth. Uh, there's there's this storytelling truth, and there's this this fact based truth, and and especially in war, you know what 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 is more true? What what gives the what what gives more truth to the story? Is it just stating the facts? Uh, this group of people went against this group of people, they fought, there were 100 casualties on this side, there were 74 on this side. And at the end of the day, the side that had fewer casualties took the hill. So that's, that's, that's what happened, right? But what about the story as told from the soldier, he might not have that overarching, you know, this, this is how many people died, this, he, he just sees what's in front of him. And he sees him getting, he, he's, he knows he's getting shot at. And he knows the guy next to him just got, got killed. And he, he smells and he feels the battle. So which more, which one of those is, is more true. And, and I just love exploring that idea in, in the different books that I read in, in how a story is presented and how that can determine different aspects of the story. So a, a good way to explore the book with, with kind of a different style and, and really in a lot of ways, the first book that does that for some of these different genres. So that was the first thing that stuck out. Second thing was the, the issue of pride. So yes, the crime in this book was murder, but when you dig deeper, when Capote shows you kind of the, the emotional side of the killers, the their childhoods, their, their thoughts, you, you see kind of the underlying issue, and it is that of, of pride. And very similar, again, to Crime and Punishment, where uh, Raskol, Raskolnikov, it, it's all about pride. Like, he, he thinks he can get away with something that the average person could not get away with. So in this book, the killer, uh, Dick, he is very intelligent. He's, he's got a high IQ, and he just thinks, you know, I'm smarter than all these other people. I can get away with this. They don't appreciate me, and I'm, I'm going to show them. So th- there's this, this aspect of pride, and murder is kind of the acting out on that. And, and same for Perry. Uh, in, in Perry, it's a little different. Perry is not like the intelligence man that Dick is, but Perry comes from a background of being abused and being abused by people that should not have, uh, I mean, you should never be abused, but, but in particular, like abused by nuns and priests and, and like people in authority that, that really, if, if they were going to be safe from, uh, other people that abused him, you, you would think, okay, he's, he's going to the nuns and the priests, they will be safe and they were not safe for him either. And so there, there's this, this pride in him too, of just, I, I should not have been treated like that. I, I'm going to get back at society and th- someone's going to pay for this, whether they were guilty or not. And so just interesting to look at, at the different, yes, there's the ramifications, there's the murders, uh, grisly murders, chilling murders, but you kind of, as Capote does, he just peels back the layers and you see there's a root issue here. And in the, the root issue is, is pride. Third thing that stuck out is just the, the writing. Uh, it was beautiful in, in a lot of, a lot of ways, uh, the descriptions of, of the land and, and things like that. And I'll, I'll, I'll read a few examples here too, but it was, it was also just chilling how it, it was written. And there was just, there was one part in particular that was so poignant and I, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but the, the killers think that there is going to be a lot of money in this house. And that's kind of the, the reason that they they chose this, this family to, to murder. And the, the money's not there. And there's a point where Perry is on his hands and knees crawling after a silver dollar that belongs to one of the children. And that's what it's come to. There's, there's, there's no money in the house. There's a silver dollar. And they're killing a family of four for very a little amount of money. 
and just that that picture of seeing this killer crawling on his belly to steal a child's silver dollar that just it really sticks with you so uh a, a few other things that were just really beautiful in, in the sense of the writing uh here's here's capote writing about kansas autumn's re- reward western kansas for all the evils that the remaining seasons impose. Winter's rough Colorado winds and hip-high sheep-slaughtering snows. The slushes and the strange land fogs of spring and summer when even crows seek the puny shade and the tawny infantude of wheat stalks bristle blaze. That was just, that was beautiful. That was page 12 in the book. The next one I wanted to read comes on page 39. A hundred miles west and one would be out of the Bible Belt, that gospel-haunted strip of American territory in which a man must, if only for business reasons, take his religion with the straightest of faces. And it goes on, but that's the end, end of what I want to read there, but just the, the Bible Belt, the gospel-haunted strip of American territory. Again, just a neat way of putting it. The next one comes on page 102. He ends one section talking about uh, the the people thinking the murderers were were among themselves, and and it was really fascinating to read this because uh, at first no one knew who had done these murders, but this was a small town, and so everybody assumes that the murderers are still there, and they assume that the murderer is amongst them, like someone they'd known, and so it just puts this huge cloud of distrust. Uh, in that town, in in Holcomb, Kansas, no one uh, before. There's the, a high level of trust. It's a small town; everybody knows each other. And then overnight, there's just distrust among amongst everybody. And so the people are talking, and and they're saying, "When this is cleared up, I'll wage I'll wager whoever did it was someone within ten miles of where we now stand." And then Capote goes uh, into the next section and it starts off this: approximately four hundred miles east of where Arthur Clutter then stood, two men were sharing a booth in the Eagle Buffet, a Kansas City diner. End quote. And I, I just love that. There's that just an example of the brilliant way that Capote is telling this story. So here's this, this town, and, and they're in an uproar because they think the killer is within 10 miles of where they stand. And then Capote starts off the next section, approximately 400 miles east. So the killers are far away. They're 400 miles away. And just that, that, that difference between 10 miles and 400, uh, just a brilliant way of telling the story. And the final thing that stuck out to me was this idea I, I briefly touched on in the, in the first segment of what a murder does internally to somebody. And that, that's a question that's explored in Crime and Punishment, and it's, in it, it's something that is, is looked at in, in this book as well. And so what, uh, what happens inside when you conduct a murder? And here are a few quotes. Page 125, deep down, Perry continued, way, way rock bottom, I never thought I could do it, a thing like that. In the page before, he said, I think there must be something wrong with us to do what we did. And then a few pages later on page 126, I can't get it out of my head that something's got to happen, end quote. So Perry's, you, you see Perry starting to struggle with this. Like how we got away with this, like we're, we're far away from the scene of the murder. And so far, no one knows that we did it. We got away with it, but... What does that say about us that we did that? Uh, and, and I don't think they thought that beforehand. You know, they thought they would just get away with it and, and they would have all this money and they would go live somewhere else and just live the rest of their life. And they, they, didn't, they didn't have it in their head that they wouldn't be able to do that because of something in their own heads, like their own conscious grabbing at them. Like something is wrong with us if we were able to do that. Another thing that was interesting, just this idea of, of being destroyed from within, is, is as the murders stick together afterwards, a lot can go wrong. Uh, there's, there's this general level of distrust, like one of them is going to tell on the other, or one of them is going to, to give up everything. And so as they stick together, it's almost like they, they 
come further and further apart because of what they have done together. It was just a really neat idea that that stuck out throughout. And a brilliant way to, to kind of close out this idea of being destroyed from within, when they ask a, a child what the uh, a, a, a interviewer asks a, a child what he thinks should be the punishment for these two men now that they've they've been caught and the 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 student this child the student replies i think they ought to be locked in the same cell for the rest of their lives never allowed any visitors just sit there staring at each other till the day they die end quote and that was a brilliant insight for this this child this student to have that uh by committing this murder together these two men it it shifted something and it it created a horror just between these two men together and the worst punishment possible would not be death the worst punishment possible would be for those two men to be in a cell for the rest of their lives staring at each other <laughs> wow Now into segment three in the one thing, my one key takeaway from In Cold Blood. So with productivity books, there's there's uh, usually one key thing I can take away and like, you know, I'm going to try to implement this in my life and 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 get this get this going. But with with novels or in this case uh, a nonfiction novel, uh, the the takeaways are usually a little different, and it and it's usually it usually comes down to something that I can't get out of my head after the novel, something that just sticks in there and won't go away. And so for In Cold Blood, the thing that sticks in my mind after reading it, and I, I finished it in, in January, so I've had some time to, to be thinking about it. The thing that sticks in my mind is just how uncomfortable the book is. You, you, you begin to feel empathy for killers. You begin to feel empathy for people who killed in cold blood, and you're not supposed to feel that empathy, Right. I mean, it's in cold blood. We're, we're distant from that. We're warm-blooded. They're cold-blooded. There is a distance. There is a chasm they crossed that we have not crossed. That distant, we, 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 we want to feel, that distance almost makes us feel safe. But Capote, by going into the, the minds, the emotions, the thoughts of these killers, it makes things really uncomfortable. There's, as the killings are taking place, Perry is showing this just strange sympathy for the victims. And he's even saving the daughter from a further atrocity. And so what do you do with that? I mean, you're reading about what becomes a compassionate killer. Uh, How do you reconcile that? So yeah, it, it was very uncomfortable. And so that's what I keep coming back to with this book. And Capote sums it up well, and and it's actually a quote from Perry, uh, where he says about the father that he kills, he said, I liked him right up to the moment I slit his throat. And that basically sums up the the entire book of just that, that uncomfortableness of there's the killer is just not this cold blooded man who just killed like, you see his feelings, like he actually likes the person that he ends up killing. And (laughs) It just makes things really uncomfortable. So Capote got quite close with with Perry uh, w- while he was writing this book, and was was actually devastated when when the execution actually uh, finally took place of of Perry, and to to where it kind of destroyed Capote's life after after that he was never never the same. Interesting book overall. Uh, this is kind of a master masterful storytelling. Um, you know what's going to happen, but you are surprised when it does. You find out as the detectives do. If you're into crude, true crime, this is sort of the godfather of true crime books. It is very disturbing, uh, chilling. I found myself locking our doors all the time, and it's just one of those books. It's You're kind of afraid of going to sleep just for the nightmares you might have. But it's a very interesting book and one that I could not put down. So that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you if you have uh, read this book. Maybe you got something out of it that that I didn't uh, or I missed. 
And I would love to hear that. So you can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. That's Eric with a K. So E-R-I-K at booksoftitans.com. Let me know what you thought of this episode or other ones. If you'd like to support this podcast, the best way you can do that is to purchase your books from Landmark Booksellers. So the link will be in the show note. And anytime you buy a book, just put in Books of Titans as the coupon code and you'll get 10% off. So you can definitely buy In Cold Blood, but you can also start buying your other books from from us at Landmark Booksellers in Franklin, Tennessee. So you can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. And the website is stock full of resources to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back in a couple of weeks, discuss another book or series from my 2022 reading list. So until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.